Eric Park. I'm running the Jacksonville City Council District 2, but right now I'm just moderating a discussion on the messaging of the Liberty Movement or the messaging of the Libertarian Party in general. Uh, so we have a panel up here, a pretty awesome panel. Uh, starting with uh, Andrea Holt, she's the Atlanta LP Chair and Director of Community Engagement with People for Liberty. We have D.L. Cummings, he's the uh, host of Liberty Dad Podcast and the Duval Affiliate Chair. On my left we have Cliff Russell, he's the host of Liberty Lockdown Podcast. <laughs> Next to him, Dave Smith, comedian and host of the Part of the Problem Podcast. Let's go! So real quick, I'm going to go over some house rules. Uh, so after the house rules, anything on vaping? No, <laughs> not that I know of. They're not on my card. Um, I'm free by five the next card level. <laughs> um, so we're going to go into the first question. We'll ask. I'm just going to go from my right to my left, y'all's left to your right, and then on the second question, we're going to do it in the opposite direction. Uh, after that, if there's any time in between that and 4.45, we're going to open up for the panelists to ask each other some questions and answers. At 4.45, we're going to go into audience Q&A as long as we have time for that as well. Um, anyone who speaks or asks questions, or first, hold any chair you're booing just for time restraints. We've got a lot going on here, really good message. Anyone who speaks or asks a question, please, no names, unless they are on the panel. Just for someone outside of the audience or someone that's not here today, that way they don't, if they don't have the opportunity to defend themselves or statements against them about their good or bad messaging within the Liberty Movement. Uh, and then whenever you're asking questions, both the panelists asking to each other and both the audience asking to the panelists, just keep your questions brief. Um, other than that, uh, let's get started. All right. So, uh... Question one, starting with DL, and we'll just go on through. You, get, you got about five minutes to answer your questions. What is your best messaging tip for communicating liberty to non-libertarians and why? Uh, do I need to stand up? Because I'm a bit yes. short. Okay, I'm going to stand up. <laughs> I can't see people, and I figure they can't see my old short self. So when I, a long time ago, before I got into the libertarian uh, movement, I was actually in the evangelical movement. Okay. No shade to them, I just moved along to something different. And I learned a lot from that movement that I now see similar in the liberty movement. So what I like to do is really approach things with the idea that the conversation that I'm having today is one that um, sets me up for the conversation tomorrow. And here's why. We've all argued and debated with people. And we've all walked away like, I told you own that person. Like, you know, they, they, they didn't have an answer or they had to say this because they knew they were wrong. But at the end of the day, what we didn't do was change their mind, right? And, and, I, and I experienced this years ago in the 90s. I experienced it now. But I realized something that a lot of times I run into people and they want to talk about some experience that they had before me. And I find it very frustrating. And so what I want to do is make sure that, you know, there's probably about 30 people in here or so, that if anybody talks to me today, Saturday, and then maybe next month comes up to any person in this room, I want the conversation, even if I'm not the one talking to them, I want the conversation that I had to set you up for an even better conversation, right? I want to lay whatever groundwork, you know, we can call it laying some seed, and then watering that seed so that it comes to fruition, however you want to describe it. What I want to do is prepare tomorrow for today. And just, I start off with this, like when I'm debating somebody or having a conversation, I start with the assumption that I am not going to change their mind. I start with that right there. And so I don't get mad if I don't, because I was expecting not to. And, but I do one thing, and this is what I like to call, uh, I don't really have a good term for it, but it's based on interactions with my mom. So once I moved on and started becoming a libertarian, my mom stayed a very heavy, evangelical, uh, hardcore Republican until the day she died. And I remember having a lot of conversations with her. 
And I felt like I really got somewhere when she would go, you know, that's a good point. She didn't necessarily say like, wow, I've changed my mind and you know, I'm, you know, I'm this new person now or whatever. She just would say like, that's a good point. And she would just acknowledge that the point was legit. And so I seek to try to get that out of the conversation. Not a, man, that was such a great point. I have no logical defense against it. Just, you know, that's an interesting point. And I've and I got a friend that comes over almost every Friday night. He's a little bit more left of center. And we, we have lots of debates. And he'll stay and we'll have cigars until like 2 or 3 in the morning. Which, by the way, if you have a toddler, I recommend you do not do that. They're ruthless the next day. Okay? They don't care. So, but we, we, we stay, he stays, and we, we, we almost always talk about whatever is going on in the news. And we usually we disagree. But sometimes he will go, well, you know, that's, that's, that's a really good point, man. I'll, I'll have to give you that one. And that's all that I'm looking for. I'm just looking just to have him acknowledge that what I said made sense. That's it. That's the way I, I approach things. I want my conversation tomorrow or today to prepare for the conversation tomorrow because I might have a conversation today, Dave Benner might have a conversation next week, Josh Smith the week after that with the same person, <laughs> right? The same person may interact. And if, if this method bounces all the way, whoever they, at some point, they're gonna land on somebody and that ground is gonna be fertile for them to go, you know what? I think I need to re uh, reassess what I believe on this particular issue. Yes. So that, that, that's my position on that. Yeah. That would be fantastic, thank you. So the question is, what is your best messaging tip for communicating liberty to non-libertarians and why? All right, I'm gonna stand up too because I have the same problem DL has. <laughs> um, First, I'll start to say a little bit about me. I work for People for Liberty. We are not affiliated with the Libertarian Party. Personally libertarian, but I get to talk about liberty all day long to 20 to 30,000 people, minus the pages I run for people, in a community where they're not necessarily libertarians. And the reason we do that is because people don't want politics. They don't, no matter how you spin it, they don't want it. And I realized this during the 2020 riots protests, shootings, whatever you want to call it. When I came to work and I was talking to somebody and she was hurt, she was upset, her heart was broken. She didn't know what to do. And she's telling me all of these things. I said, you gotta vote them out. That's what you gotta do. And she looked at me and she goes, it's not all about politics and quit making it about politics. I'm hurting and this doesn't fix it right now. You're right, it doesn't fix it. It will eventually, but right now it is no good. I need to listen to you, I need to hear what you have to say, and I need to come up with a plan moving forward, right? And that's what I do, and that's how I communicate liberty. I communicate it through action. We poll people, we talk to people. If you're not a libertarian, maybe you are. Maybe you are just in a liberty movement. Maybe you care about ranked choice voting. Maybe you care about qualified immunity, gun rights. What's important to you? And communicating liberty is not communicating politics, and I think we get confused in that a lot of times because we're communicating what's important to the people at that moment in their time, and it may end up being politics, but you can't bring the politics first. And that's the reason I love what I do, is because I get to give the liberty message to people who are not libertarian all day long. They may end up there by their own free will, right? Because we're not gonna force you there. They may end up there, but we're gonna work with you right now. Do you, what do you care about? Do you care about immigration? All right, guess what? We work with this organization over here, so let's bring you in and let you pl and plug you in there. How can you help the liberty movement through that? And I think that's important where we get really messed up because we get, keep thinking about what kind of messaging do we need? Do we need bold messaging? Is our messaging plan? No, the messaging is neither, the messaging is action. And if we're not getting out there and we're not being active in our communities, we're not listening to the people and what they need, it doesn't matter if we have bold messaging, bland messaging, whatever kind of messaging, because they're not gonna see it because people are done with politics. 80 million people did not vote in the election. Think about that. More people didn't vote than voted for Trump or Biden because they didn't want to. Not because they didn't like them, they polled, were polled. They are done with politics. And we're never going to win those people if we keep preaching politics. Sure. 
What is your best messaging tip for communicating liberty, liberty to non-libertarians and why? Um, all right, so I, I'm going to sit because I'm tall. Um, <laughs> um, I, so I guess that, look, it could be different in different situations. Like, I think there's different strategies to employ if you're talking to your mother than if you're talking to a, a stranger on the bus. I think there's a different strategy to if you're talking to thousands of people on a platform than if you're talking in a room like this right now, you know. But if you're talking about how to, to communicate to non-libertarians, I think the, mo the biggest tip that I would give libertarians, and specifically the libertarians speaking on a platform and, and to the public in some way, this is what I see as the biggest flaw. What I see, at, it'll be at this convention, I see at every single libertarian convention and every single libertarian you know, meetup that, I, that I've been to, is that you get people who get up there and talk all about our philosophy. And you know how we have, well, we believe in decentralization and voluntary interactions and isn't it so great that we have this great unified theory about everything and human action and all of this stuff. And this, just to most people, sounds like you like your philosophical abstractions in your head and okay, but that's pretty removed from the real world. And I'm sure a bunch of you have heard this from other people before. You know, some variation of like, yeah, 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 that's nice in libertarian abstraction land, but here in the real world, Putin just invaded, and so something's got to be done, or whatever, you know, the issue is. So what I, my big thing is that what libertarians should always be talking about are the crises that are affecting the American people. That's what you should be talking about. That's what you focus on. It's like what's actually affecting real people. Not nonsense that's like, and I love libertarian theory as much as anyone does, but that's not what matters. What matters is how our theory interacts with the real world. And what matters is, and right now, if you, if you haven't noticed, like, you know, the world is burning. Like, there's a lot of crises. And if you don't have an answer for that, then, you, then you're going to have a real problem connecting. And I think one of our biggest advantages is that we, m most of the people in power, are very into distractions because they don't really want you to focus on these crises and how they created all of them. So they, they love, like, if the controversy of the day is like, Joe Rogan, instead of saying the N word, said the word. Oh my God, let's all freak out about that, you know? And, and uh, so, so they like stuff like this because then they don't have to focus on, like, oh yeah, like your money's being destroyed. But that's something where libertarians really have something to say. And I think Clint, you know, I don't want to steal his thing, but I think he's like a great example of this. I mean, he became like one of the biggest voices in the liberty movement out of nowhere in a very small, small period of time because he was almost entirely, singularly focused on the biggest crisis that was happening in America right now, which was the lockdowns and the COVID regime and all of these restrictions. So that's it. Let's focus on what's actually happening to you. But that means something to people. And for me, what libertarians need to do is we need to, and this is like the, the center of my mission, is that we need to force the association, I know we don't like forced association, but we need to force the association of what it, what it is when a, when a regular person thinks the word libertarian. What is it that they think? And one of the big problems we have right now is that when someone thinks the word libertarian, a lot of them think Aleppo. <laughs> or they think, um, you know, you must be actively anti-racist. They think about, listen, things that we don't, which neither of those are libertarian, you know? But what I'm trying to do, like my whole project, is to insist that if you think libertarian, you think anti-war, anti-COVID regime, anti, uh, you know, fiat currency, anti uh, corporate corporatism, and the bailout state, and all of that, because those are things that really matter. That there's large um, super majorities of Americans who are against all of that stuff already. So that's, I would say, you know, that would be my tip. Uh, Lodi, you got it. <laughs> I'll, I'll pick you back off that. Wait, um, what's your name? Clint Russell <laughs> from Liberty Lockdown. <clears throat> so in the 90s, I think that it was okay to be more passive and plant seeds, as DL was talking about. I certainly did that. I converted most of my family members, uh, pretty much all of my friends, but it took decades. I don't feel like we have decades anymore, to be perfectly honest. Um, I think most people that understand 
Austrian economics understand that we have a severe economic crisis that's going to come from all of the building and insanity and the lockdowns that we've experienced over the past two years. So my goal with my show as well as my platform has been to try and correlate the problems that people are experiencing in their day-to-day -day lives with libertarian ideology, but not in a preaching way. You know, just simply explaining, filling in the blanks to people that, that they go, well, everything at the store costs a hell of a lot more. Why? If they listen to the media, they're going to get a whole bunch of bullshit. And we know that. So I feel like it's our mission to speak courageously in the moment, explaining what's transpiring, what's affecting them, and to try and get them to connect the dots from what's actually damaging them now and why. Because as of my entire life, they haven't done it. They haven't connected the dots as to big government being the genesis of almost every problem that they face. And I think that's what makes libertarians special, is that we understand that problem better than anybody. We also have another problem, that we come off extremely antagonistic towards people that don't understand things as well as we do. So, as furious as I am with the situation that we've experienced over the past two years, I think it's really important that you try and have an open heart and a sense of forgiveness and kindness to people that are willing to listen to you because they've gone through a hell of a lot too, just as we all have. So I pair it both fire with, with kindness and love and uh, I think that that's, that's a good way to reach people. Second question, starting on my left with Clint. Oh, I need to catch my breath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know when you're ready. That's okay, good. <laughs> what is the most needed change you see necessary from libertarians when communicate, communicating liberty and libertarian ideas? I'm gonna read that again. Thank you. What is the most needed change you see necessary from libertarians when communicating liberty and libertarian ideas? Uh, I kind of already addressed that in my last one, so I'm gonna see if I have another angle on it. <laughs> you want to take it? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm always ready to talk. Um, well, I mean, like, okay, so I kind of, you know, um, address this to some degree, too. I think, uh, you know, addressing the crises that face the American people rather than the theory that, the beautiful theory, by the way, which I really love, that we all love in our minds. Um, on top of that, what one of the things that I see, and this is really uh, the way I see it, has been the entire um, project of the Mises Caucus, which I'm a member of. Um, and the entire, uh, you know, like my entire project since being in the Libertarian Party. So I think one of the major problems that we have in this party is that there is, I believe, a split between a group of people in the Libertarian Party who feel like we, whether they would say it this way or not, that we must not offend the corporate press zeitgeist. And I think that there is that, as far as I'm concerned, is a dead end that we have no chance of victory if we go down that path. And the way I, you know, I, and I understand almost like uh, superficially where people see it this way. I know I get this criticism a lot. This is like one of the major criticisms that people say of me is they'll be like, um, they'll be like, okay, really? You're gonna, you know, you're, you're thinking about the idea of running Dave Smith? What, the corporate press will have a field day with that guy. And that's kind of their attitude, which, okay, um, superficially I understand. Where you think like, well, if the corporate press is going to call you a racist and a bigot and an awful person, then that's how we're going to come off to everybody. But the way I look at it is like, if we're ever in a position of actually winning, I promise you, the corporate press is going to call you a racist and a bigot and try to make you come off that way to everybody. So if we're afraid of that, then honestly, I think we should disband and give up. Like close up shop then. Because there's no way that we, we don't get to destroying the ring without walking through that fire. That's not good. So what I think we should do is be unapologetically libertarian and tell the truth. And the truth is something that is going to wildly offend the corporate press zeitgeist. But that's actually what we believe. And you know what? I had to say, I, I'll probably say something like this in my speech. I said this in my speech in uh, California the other day. I mean, you got these like, I mean, if all of these other people that I see out there who have been wrong about everything can be so unapologetic in what they believe, why can't we be unapologetic in believing what's actually right? You know, I was on this panel, um, uh, on a Fox News panel, like a few weeks ago, and there was some Democratic strategist lady uh, on it, I don't even remember her name, 
And she's just repeating, you know, the talking points over. And she just says at one point, she goes, look, we all know if you get this vaccine, you're not going to get very sick or die. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember just having this moment where I was like, man, that must be nice. <laughs> just be able to say bullshit and like, no one's going to call you out on that. Like, you don't have to worry about being fact checked or anything. But the, the point is, like, like, they are just so unapologetic in what they believe. And what we believe is so much better, so why should we be? So that's, that's it. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, obviously, I agree with Dave on pretty much everything. So uh, I think that is correct. Yes, it is, <laughs> and it's the correct position to have. Um, I think that that the main reason I got involved in this is because I was so disappointed with the lack of courage coming from the Libertarian Party in the most important infringement on liberty in my lifetime. And it's not even close. The lockdowns were insane. It was just from Jump Street, not an acceptable libertarian position to hold. No matter how dangerous the virus was, it was incumbent upon this party to stand out and stand above every other coward that was unwilling to defend our rights. And for me, that's why I got involved because I didn't see the messaging coming from the Libertarian Party. I saw it from a few podcasters, God bless the guy to my right, I saw it from Tom Woods and others, uh, but there was not enough of it. And I think that those are the moments where you, you differentiate yourself in a meaningful way that compels people to give your ideas serious consideration, a la Ron Paul in 2008 and 2005 when he was warning people about uh, the coming uh, real estate collapse. These are, the, these are the opportunities that we have in front of us same as we have today with the Russia and Ukraine war. And if we are going to be a party that expects to change anything in our lifetimes, we have to be willing to talk when it matters, when there's a crisis, when we don't have clear answers, but we have principles that other people don't have, because none of these fuckers have. They don't have principles. We have them. So let's stand up and act as if we know what we're talking about, because we do. So that's it. Let's react the question. All right. <laughs> what is the most needed change you see necessary from libertarians when communicating liberty and libertarian ideas? All right. So I have to back up and tell you a little bit about me. I voted for whoever I thought was the least shitty for many years. Um, best way to put it. Didn't really feel like I belonged in any party, and eventually the parties left me, right? I couldn't find one that was less worse than the other one, and that's how I found the Libertarian Party. They both, they were polarizing. They pulled at you and said, well, you have to vote for me because I believe in these rights, or you have to vote for me because I don't believe in these rights, to the point where nothing they talked about, I didn't believe in that. So where does that leave me? And a lot of people are in that same spot right now. Where does that leave me? I'm just hanging out here, floating around. I guess I'll vote for somebody if I have to. Guess I won't. In Georgia, I don't vote for a lot of people because they're all horrible. So, except for our Georgia people, Shane Hazel, sorry, Angela Pence, we got some good ones. We got Ryan Ryan, we got a lot of people running. So I will vote for them. But here's what happens when I go, I think I'm a libertarian. Where do I find out about this? Well, you gotta go to social media, right? That's the only, you go to the platform, you read it, okay, well, what, what does this mean? I don't understand any of this. I don't study Austrian economics. I don't watch any podcasts. I have no idea. And I'm not unusual. That sounds unusual to you guys, because you guys know these guys. But me, as floating around in this sea of I don't know, I go to social media and I literally type in libertarian. That's what I do, and I find Larry Sharp in 2016. And I started listening to Larry Sharp, just on social media, not a podcast. These three guys have made me listen to podcasts, and I'm angry at them for it. I like, oh, would never do it. I'm so poor, I would never do it. I listen to you, I listen to you, I listen to you now. Because I wanted to know their messaging style before I came up here. The problem is, once I stepped out of just watching what Larry had to say, and I went into a group on social media in Libertarian Party, I was ridiculed. I was called names, I was told I was a statist, I was a commie, I was a bootlicker, I was all of these things. Does that appeal to anybody here? Does anybody want to stick with those people? You got probably do now, but as someone who's just coming to the party, 
I call myself a, a passive libertarian for many years. That did not entice me to do anything else. So I stepped back. And I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't, I don't like these people. I don't want to be affiliated with them. That's not who I am. So what do I do? Luckily, I found the People for Liberty groups. And guess what? We don't let you call people that because we're going to have adult conversations in here about real life problems. And that's where I found my plug. That's where I found me being able to do something in the liberty world that was welcoming and inviting to people. We talk about real stuff every single day. We talk about the war. We, we, we are real with it. We have military supporters for liberty, and we're having people join us left and right now because they said, I don't, I don't want part of it. I don't want to be part of this. Well, let's talk about this. This is real. This is what's happening. But we're not going to over-talk people. I, I understand Austrian economics. I've tried to read some economics books. I can't do it, man. I don't know how you guys do it. I don't know how you guys do it. I understand it. I can listen to some videos, you know, those kinds of things. Everything's good. You're not going to talk to me and, and win me over with that. You're going to talk to me about what matters in my life. And you're going to talk to me, and we're going to enjoy conversation. And we may not agree with each other on some things. You know, we don't all agree on the border. And that's fine. That's fine. We don't all agree on certain things. But I think what's really lacking in the liberty messaging is just going, I see you, let's talk about it, and let's figure it out. And instead, these people go into social media and they're belittled. And some of you may have done it to me. I mean, it's, to be honest. And I, I leave that group and I go, okay, I'm not going to be in there because I don't want to be called that. I have some really good ideas and I really want to talk about these things. So unlike DL, I plant the seeds all day long, every single day. Bring people in, let's talk about this. And I'm gonna to listen to you. And I think that that's what we lack a lot of our ability, because we, we know so much, right? You guys are all smarter than me, and that's fine. We know so much and we want to speak our knowledge, but really we need to listen. Standing from the short <laughs> side. <laughs> so I think what I have to say actually will complement the, uh, the other three panelists. Uh, so let me give a side story here real quick, just to kind of, kind of lay the groundwork for what I'm about to say. My wife is in real estate. She's a real estate investor. She's a real estate agent. And once upon a time, we were both in a very large real estate organization up in Jacksonville. And she was on the board. And she said, man, there's a lot of fighting. It's pretty nasty. And I was like, wow. And for reasons we don't need to get into, I decided to go on the board and push back on somebody that was, that was in the organization that we felt was making a little bit of trouble. So I was like, you know what? I ain't afraid, whatever. And it turned out it was extremely nasty. So nasty that it actually ended up just before the point where lawyers were, well actually lawyers were called, but before the point where people started filing lawsuits against each other, okay? So it got, it got extremely nasty, potentially could have lost some good friends. Here's where I'm going with that. My wife is not me. I'll go into a room, I will stand in front of this entire crowd and say what I got to say, and if you don't like it, I'm gonna stand here and just be like, well, I guess I gotta figure out how to deliver it a little bit better, right? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'll, I'll go in and, and have a fight with somebody, right? I, I'll duke it out, it doesn't matter to me. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, my wife won't, and she will hightail it out of there the moment that it starts getting hostile. And what's interesting is she's always like, you know, why is it with politics you guys fight all the time? My wife, by the way, is from Indonesia. So uh, she has a, a bit of a different experience. So she comes over here and she's like, why are you guys fighting about politics all the time? So I think the problem that I see, that, that, that the biggest problem that I see that we, that we can fix is giving the most charitable interpretation of somebody's intentions and their words. And I see this all the time. Like, this is what we need to start doing. And, I've, and I, like, I see faces in here, people on the panel, where I've watched conversations happen, and that wasn't done. You know what happens? That's when the fighting starts. That's when people like my wife check out. And doesn't she, like, based on the stories that I've told her, even if she did become a libertarian, like, you would be, uh, it would be a damn miracle if she would actually get involved. Because she would be like, to hell with that shit, I don't want it. I don't want, I don't want to have any part of that. Because she's already got enough stress in her life as it is, right? She's got, her, you know, a toddler, a, a larger toddler, <laughs> right? Someone, you know, like she's I, she's busy working. I mean, and 
it's interesting, she's also the person that I think I can give an illustration of having done that. Because she's uh, Indonesian, she's ethnically Chinese. When COVID broke out, she was talking to a contractor on the phone and um, one of the, you know, the, the Trump rah, rah, rah type contractors, the good guy, a really hardworking um, AC guy. And he just started saying, I don't remember exactly what he said, but he said something to the effect of, you know, I don't care. You know, they just need to close the borders or something like that. I don't care if a million Chinese people die, as long as it doesn't come over here. Something like that. So my wife could have been like, look, you racist bastard, I'm never calling you again. But instead, being the more diplomatic person that she actually is, she said, now so and so. We should always be concerned about you know, large numbers of people dying, and we should really care about other people, even if it doesn't affect us. It was something along the line. And she totally disarmed the guy, right? She took a charitable interpretation, and, and instead of taking it and saying, you're a terrible racist, she just put that to the side just naturally. And she just said, look, man, she appealed to his inner you know, emotional life. We should care about people. It doesn't matter who they are, right? And because of that charitable interpretation of his intent and his, you know, she didn't walk away feeling like she had this huge racist incident. In fact, she probably doesn't, if I ask her right now, she'd be like, uh, oh yeah, yeah, I remember that conversation. Like, it's just it's not in her mind, right? But then also, the conversation, you could, I could hear it, because he was on the speakerphone, I could hear the conversation changed in tone. Now, did he turn around and say, you know what, I'm sorry for saying that? Say, no, none of that, right? All he did was he got disarmed, but this conversation shifted in a more positive direction, and they were able to do the business that needed to be done. And I feel like that's what we need to start doing, is giving the most charitable interpretation of people's words and intentions so that we can get the business done and be those loud voices and talk to people. So we do have some extra time for uh, the people up on the panel to ask each other questions. Um, we we'll start with one from this side and then one from this side, and we have one. We'll go back to this side. To this side. Glenn, would you like to ask a question on the short side? <laughs> <laughs> What's it like? <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. I don't really have a question uh, in mind. Uh, you guys got something ready? I got something ready. Right. <laughs> I'm listening to you guys, I am prepared. <laughs> so at Oakley, California, Dave, I heard your, your little speech, and you said we do not need mass media as a party or a liberty voice to accomplish anything. What did you mean by that, and what is your plan otherwise? Well, what, what I said is that we don't need the corporate press. Right. Um, and I just think, because you know, so many people in this party have had this attitude that I still see. This, it was, this was asked in the, uh, the LP chair debate in California last week. The, um, the, the moderator um, was, um, was uh, Judge uh, Jim, Jim Gray, Gray. Uh, was moderating. And he asked, it was, it was just an implicit, like a given in the question. He was like, well, seeing as how we need to get in the presidential debates, obviously, in order for us to be legitimate, how do we get in the debates? And like, so that was already just, and, and a lot of people in this party have that attitude. Like it's, it's obviously, we have to be able to get on CNN and we have to get in the presidential debates and all of this. And I'm just sitting here and going like, I don't know, dude, I've done Joe Rogan's podcast like seven times. It's way bigger than all of those corporate press shows combined. And if we're at a place now where, if you look, just look at it, the political landscape, and you have these shows, like obviously Rogan being kind of the, the biggest one, but there's so many other of, of these shows, like uh, Tim Pool and uh, Dave Rubin and uh, Steven Crowder and uh, Ben Shapiro, and like all oh, these guys have millions and millions of viewers for every show. I'm just like, I don't know, why is it so necessary for us to get the dying legacy media? Don't get me wrong, I do the legacy dying media. Like, I'll do their shows if they have me on. I'm not saying, like, we need to boycott them. I'm just saying that we need to realize that there's other opportunities here where we can go to get our message out, and in many ways, in a more effective way, with longer, a lot more time, and to a much bigger audience. <clears throat> He's obviously done the biggest platforms. I've done medium-sized ones, and even myself only having started less than two years ago, in the past 12 months I've been heard, my voice has been heard by millions of people. That's crazy. And I did that without any radio, any TV. So 
That's that's the argument. Is that basically, in my perspective, I don't know if Dave would fra phrase it exactly like this, but we're fighting the old war with their tools when we have new tools to fight the new war. And I think that social media, podcasts, things of that nature are really where it's at, and that's the future frontier, and we are making our names in it. So let's continue to put resources towards that. That would be my perspective. I would like to add, the reason I asked this question is because right before I came here, I had to go up to Kentucky where I'm from to my parents who are in their 60s, and they get up every morning and they turn the news on. And that's where they get their information. If you look at my father and go, who's Joe Oregon? He's like, oh, I heard about the guy. <laughs> and he did that fighting stuff. That, that's my dad. And these are still our voter base. Sure. Um, so how are you ever going to appeal to them through Joe Rogan? I mean, Joe has, I've got the numbers here, I can pull them. Because I, I made sure I knew. He has a wide audience. Up until this week, I didn't listen to Joe Rogan. I listened to Joe Rogan because I wanted to hear Dave Smith talk. <laughs> I should all let him know that I'm getting some news. That show was three hours long. And I don't know who has an extra three hours in their day to listen to Joe Rogan? I don't. Yep. I luckily was driving an absurd amount of hours this week so I could listen to him. But any given day, I'm not going to listen to Joe Rogan. Well, well I, I'm not going to argue with you that your father isn't going to listen or that you're not going to listen. Yep. I'm just telling you objectively about 40 times as many people are listening to him as are listening to all of the corporate press outlets. Yep. They've, uh, they're about 20 times as much as listen to all of them combined. So um, again, I'm not saying yeah. there are certain people who you're not going to reach. I'm just objectively speaking, there are way more people who know who Joe Rogan is than know who uh, Brian Stelter is. Like that's just a <laughs> fact. Like, you know what I mean? So I'm just saying that this is a, an opportunity to reach a lot more people. Uh, I think it's true that for older people, like for your father, that they are still getting a lot of their news in that traditional way. Uh, we want to do whatever we can to reach everybody. I am particularly concerned with reaching young people because I think that's how you affect the future. You know what I mean? Um, but I, I would say that ultimately, li what libertarians want to do is try to get to as many people as possible that we are able to kind of change the national conversation and make more of those people have to deal with, with our arguments. But listen, to, that's kind of why I added the, the caveat that I'm not saying we shouldn't try to get on those shows too. I mean, if you could get on Meet the Press or you can get on, you know, Fox News Sunday or something, then I say go do that. You know. All right. So we have about an extra five minutes to add to the 15 minutes of audience Q and A. Do y'all want to use that up here or offer it up again? All right. Well, can I just say yeah, one thing because I just wanted to kind of echo what what both of you guys kind of pointed out, which I think is a really important point, is that like I do I, I do personally believe like. I think like, still a huge part of the mission, probably the number one part of the mission to me, is to try to make as many more libertarians, introduce as many more people to the ideas of liberty and all of this stuff. But I do think we also have to accept that there's a lot of what we're trying to do is also just make people better. You know, like, so if we can make someone you know, who's like a, a liberal progressive better on being anti-war, and they're still a liberal progressive, but they're just an anti-war liberal progressive, that that's still a win. And yeah. if you can make some conservative who's like a Trump supporting conservative and whatever, you know, uh, you know, he's been to protectionism and wants to deport illegal immigrants and all of that, but you could make him really good on opposing the Federal Reserve, okay, well that's better than a Trump populist who doesn't oppose the Federal Reserve. You know what I mean? And so and, and to just kind of echo that spirit, we can't kind of play this game where anyone who's not a 100 percenter needs to be demonized somehow. We have to somehow be open to like people just being a little bit better and, and being closer aligned with us. So I think it's important that we're not shitty to people like that. Yes. I, I, I completely agree with that. <laughs> so we're going to open it up to the audience for some Q&A. Uh, Yep, just raise your hand if you have a question, one moment, and uh, keep your question under 30 seconds, or if you have more than one, ask it really fast. All right, let's go. Yep. All right, so a quick observation is I believe that both sides of the panel were talking about two completely different topics when they were talking. I believe uh, DL and, um, I'm sorry, um, Andrea. Andrea, I'm sorry. Um, you guys were talking about actually having conversations with people, and Dave and Clint were talking about general messaging. 
and I think it's important that we should be drawing a distinction between the two, and so <coughs> that you guys can see how that could be observed by somebody in the audience. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. I yeah, I, I tried to mention at the beginning, saying like there are different strategies. Yeah. For, right. You know, like talking to someone one on one, talking to a family member is also very different than just talking to a friend. I mean, like talk. It's a very different thing to try to talk to someone. You know, talk, talking to like a parent. Or something like that. You, you know, it's it's tougher to be a kind of like, well, let me explain the world to you. And they're like, I used to wipe your ass. But yeah, I think that's an important distinction. I, I, so I, I think, for me at least, and Andrea can you know can speak for herself. I think that what the way that I look at it is complementary to what they're doing, and I don't actually disagree. I do think that we should get out there and be bold. When I first came into the Libertarian Party. Um, you know, I, I was I was really off put by a lot of anarchists, right? I hope there's not too many in here. But, <laughs> right. <laughs> but here's the thing. And, and here's the thing. The reason is because it felt like the conversation was so difficult, right? Like it was just difficult to have a conversation because it was just like somebody just it was almost like somebody just interrupting just to tell you every little point where you were wrong and not hearing you. And this is my problem. I'm like. It's hard to be bold if somebody doesn't feel hurt. I can be bold all I want. I can say, look, the lockdown should have never, ever happened. We should never even be discussing a vaccine mandate, right? These are things that I absolutely 100% believe with many, many people in here, probably, hopefully all of you. I was opposed to the mandates from the very beginning, from back in like, what, May of 2020 when they started talking about it, right? And, but I also recognize that just because I want to be bold and talk to people and say, this is what I believe, I think I need to be able to have that conversation with them. And I need to be, and there are certain things that need to go into that conversation. So that, you know, it's a little different if you're talking like on a podcast, you're talking to a whole bunch of people, so your audience is going to be broader, right? So I'm talking to like, you know, 20, 30 people here now, well, more than that actually. But I'm talking to, a, you know, a big handful of people. But if I were to pick one of you out, and try to have a similar conversation. Same thing, same conversation. If I just talk over you, if I use you know insults, whatever, all these kind of things, you know, if I just kind of you know kind of sneer at some of the things that you say back, you're not going to feel heard. And you don't give a damn how bold my messaging was or how on target it was. So I, I think I'm complimenting them and just saying like, look, the first step is to remember it. You're talking to a person. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No rebuttal. Good. No, I, I mean I agree with him. I, I just would say that you know, like if you were to only know Dave based off of his Twitter, you would probably get a pretty misconstrued notion of who he is as a human being. And same with me, and I think same with most people. And when I'm when I'm interacting on a broad audience level, uh, where it's not personalized, I will come off more crass, and I'm trying to make a point. I'm right. I'm trying to like broadly craft a narrative almost. Whereas if I have someone on my show in a long format, I can be much more kind. I can be much more open. Mm -hmm. I can have a give and take in the conversation. So um, I think that's just about being not just a good speaker, but a good person. Like it, if you come at someone like you're trying to dunk on them like you're on Twitter uh, on a podcast, you look kind of crazy. So right. you know, it's, it's all different formats, but I don't think there's actually that much area of disagreement between us. We were just kind of addressing different things. Well, can I, I would just say um, that I'm awesome on Twitter, so I don't know what talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Best Twitter followers you can possibly have. I agree, actually. Um, just nothing but fire. I'll be able to make that clear. But look, I also, I think that, look, like, while I agree with DL um, to some extent, I think there are different, and appropriately, there are different instances where different responses make sense. Mm -hmm. And, like, if I walk out of here and someone grabbed me, and they went, hey, Dave, you know, I really disagree with you about immigration, and I'd like to talk to you about that. And it would be completely inappropriate if I was, like, shitty to that person. They'd be like, what? But if so I ran after you, and they went, you know, you're a goddamn fascist for your immigration. <laughs> and then I was nasty to that person. That would make a lot more sense. In the same way that, like, if someone threw a fist at me, that I'm going to have a different response to them than if someone goes to shake my hand. And while it is good to be sensitive and have empathy for people, one of the t things that's constantly used against libertarians and just honest people in general are these tactics of like shaming and ridiculing and insulting people for stepping out of line. And I gotta say, as somebody who's one of the bigger, you know, like figures in this movement, I think that there's some value 
in that I demonstrate to everyone, because Twitter is not a one-on-one -on -one conversation, it's right. a conversation in front of all of my people, that I demonstrate to them that if someone comes at me like that, you will, like, you will get a return in kind. Mm -hmm. And right. in the same way that I would teach either one of my kids that like if somebody hits you, I, I'm like, I'm not one of these new school parents. If somebody hits you, <laughs> you punch them back because that's, you let them know that that's what's gonna happen. And, and this is not like a rebut, it's not like an either or thing. There are just different situations, like in life, where different responses are appropriate. Right. So, I know we've got a lot of questions yeah. popping up. There was one back in the back thing, the guy in the hat, and yes. then the next one, no, other hat, yeah. in front of you. Yes. The, uh, the guy with the hat about freedom? Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> Hawaiian guy. shirt with a hat. So that's that's right. right, that's everybody. Okay. And then, so, uh, you, and then the other hat that has my name on it. So, but then after that, if you have questions, can you come start lining up over here to the side so that I don't, or in the side, so that I know what order to have. All right, go ahead, throw a second with you. Okay, so I'll try and make this quick. This question is geared towards Dave, but it applies to everyone. How do you reach out to people from like the social justice warrior group left? Because I've noticed more than ever, anything, like the what you would call the red pill left, like the Russell Brand types, they're receptive to us. A lot of those Trump conservatives, they're receptive to us. These social justice warrior people, it's like, you'll try to have a conversation, even if it's civil, and they just shut down immediately. Like, there's almost like an invisible wall that just goes up. The reason why I gear this towards Dave is because one time I, I had a family member in my car who's kind of one of those types of people, and one of your podcasts was playing, and they actually were receptive to it. And I'm just like amazed, like out of all the people Five that I know. Um, so like, how do you reach those kind of people? Well, it, again, it's, that's tough, and I think it's probably the toughest group. Uh, to, to reach, and I'm not saying we shouldn't try, but I do think libertarians should recognize that if you're going to be spending your effort catering to one group, that's probably the last one. Family, <laughs> 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 family. These are these are um, uh, cult members, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that doesn't mean it's not a worthy thing to try to pull someone out of a cult, and it can successfully be done. Um, but I think it's kind of a process, and I think that usually. You have to, you, you're not going to logic them out of it. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever tried to argue with logic with like a woke yeah. social justice warrior, but that is not going to, it's not going to work. They have, that's, uh, they have kryptonite or whatever, it's like, yeah. it's a rational argument. Um, I think that they are playing a role in a movie in their head. And that's what attracts them to uh, wokeism, is that wokeism allows them to be the great fighter against perceived bigotry or whatever. And in some ways you need to offer them a different role, or at least make them realize that that role actually really sucks. And like, as harsh as that is, to let them know that actually you're the bad guy in this movie. And that's, that could be kind of, a lot of them are going to have a bad reaction to that, but it's kind of like telling someone that they're in a cult. That might kind of hurt, <laughs> yeah, but it's true. I would like to add a little yep. something if I can. So I go into these progressive groups and I talk to them um, on social media because I want to know what's going on, right? Like, why, what's happening here? And I'll ask a question and I'll just listen. Because ultimately they want something, right? They may not even know what they want sometimes. They just are following the crowd so they think that's what they want. And you start just asking questions. And sometimes it's just starting there. Deal start, talks about you know planting these little seeds, and sometimes we are not going to get them today. We may not get them tomorrow. But if you just ask them questions and see where you can get in, sometimes just that little seed may open their eyes a little bit. I don't spend a lot of time either. I go in, sometimes we'll post some anti-war stuff or something, move on. Um, but sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I've gotten a couple people to come on into one of our groups and listen to us talk, and they may not agree with us, but they came in and tried. Better than not being the yeah. man. Right. You know, I think there was something to be said about playing a role, you've offered them a different role to play. Um, what I find out of a lot of people is that sometimes people are very terrible at communicating what they really want, mm -hmm. right? So I often illustrate it by saying, like, you know, a man comes home, he's worked really hard all day, and his wife is like, upset about something, he digs in, finds out, and she just kind of blows up and says, you know, you never take me out anymore. And he's like, what are you talking about? I just took you out last Thursday, right? You know, and he's like, he's like befuddled. He's like, what, what do you mean not? We just literally last Thursday. When I think in this particular- You're talking to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so so when, I, when I think, 
what I think is, you know, we have to dig deeper than the surface level of what's being said, right? In this particular case, what might be trying, what the woman might be trying to communicate is more like, hey, we go out so infrequently, it feels like we never go out. Or when we do go out, you're so busy talking about your stuff and your day and whatever that it feels like we might as well not have went out at all because I didn't get anything for me, right? And, and I think if we use that to kind of start understanding, like sometimes people say things or they follow a path to play this role, they really want something else, potential. But you have to dig in and find it. And it's very, very difficult. And I think that's what makes it difficult for people who are playing a role or who, who don't really realize what they actually are looking for. And, and, and that's difficult. And I think the easiest way to do that is ask a bunch of questions, very Socratic method, and start asking questions, not like 20 questions, just, you know, you, you ask one or two, and then you see where it try, you, you, you see where, you, what you're trying to do is say, Let, let's get us to where you really are, wherever that is. Because the first words that came out of your mouth are probably not it. <laughs> Super quick. Uh, I don't, as I said with my very first answer, I don't feel as if we have a ton of time before we deal with the ramifications of a really bloated government, warfare, welfare state, everything else. So uh, I am not going to spend any of my personal resources reaching out to people that think I'm evil because of my skin color. That's my personal opinion. You can take your own tactic. I don't have any problem with people reaching out to them. I think that there is value depending on who it is, and if you know them personally, maybe they can be reached. But on a broad level, no, I'm not spending any time trying to reach um, I want to share this with the whole group. And it's in a way more in a comment than a question, but I think it especially relates to what you said earlier, the whole thing of politics. Because I found when I first got interested many years ago, that then when, because this was before I became a libertarian, what I would share with people was I would word it this way, sort of knowing instinctively that the word politics makes people go, oh, you know. So I said, I discovered that I have a passion for how to bring sanity to government. 10 seconds. And what I noticed is people could relate to that because that resonates with most people. That's all. I would, I would like to add on that just really quick. So I don't know if any of you follow marketing at all. Uh, Apple has one of the best marketing program things in the world. They started with the why. They didn't sell you on the phone. They didn't sell you on what you needed. They sold you on why you needed it. The party is not the why, it's the what. If you sell them on the why, not politics, they'll get their what. And I think we forget that. Back in the back, yeah. black hat that says Eric Parker for Jax, go ahead. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the use of populist, or populist rhetor rhetoric to promote the libertarian movement? For example, um, Huey Long used a lot of populist rhetoric. And people in Louisiana who remember him today still remember, still remember him fondly and are also ardent anti-socialists when he had a proposed program called the Cure Our Wealth. Um, I, I, I'm a complete uh, Rothbardian. Uh, in terms of the, the populist strategy, I think not only is it the uh, appropriate, I think it's our only hope, is to have a massive populist libertarian movement. And if you think of, I mean, to, to me, libertarians are the best populists. I mean, we're actually the ones who understand how the ruling elite are screwing over regular people. And we always should be on the side of regular people and against the ruling elite. And we're the only ones who actually have an understanding of how that is done and why the only way to solve that problem is to have a drastic reduction in the size of government. Um, because basically, the, and this is one of the major problems when you'll have like kind of um, like conservative free market types, they'll argue um, you know, these kind of like abstractions as if we're in a free market. You know, it's like, so that it'll be like, you know, a lot of times you'll have the debate will be between like a, a left-wing socialist type and a more right-wing free market type. And the, deb the debate will be something about like, well, there's all of this inequality, you know, where the rich people have so much and the rest of the people have so little in comparison. And then the right-wing free market type will say, well, but in a free market, if somebody has so much, that's just because they're better and worked harder and did more and therefore they deserve it. 
But that's all completely an abstraction and not looking at the current system, which is that this entire game is rigged on behalf of the powerful. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're opposed to. So I'm fine with somebody being a trillionaire in a free market if they did it by you know, voluntarily convincing other people to buy their product or whatever, then that's fine. But every goddamn billionaire in this country is on welfare. So I don't know why uh, we shouldn't be standing up for the people who are subsidizing billionaires forcibly. I don't think it's a, like, populism can be looked at as a dirty word among some libertarians, some, you know, subsections. Uh, I think that we exist in a populist moment and a movement, whether we like it or not. There, there are, all of the dissident factions that exist in this country are realizing what they're up against to some extent. Many of them are attributing it to the wrong things, but they're, they're starting to get that the game is rigged. So, we have a choice. We can either step out of the populist rhetoric game and allow them to be trapped into identitarian racist rhetoric, or you can get them into the Marxist identitarian racist rhetoric, uh, or we can get them into liberty-minded rhetoric. So that's my preference. I see myself using it a hell of a lot more lately on Twitter, and I don't know when it started happening, but I'm, I'm using them and us and all this stuff, and I'm like, yeah, well, all right, here we go. Uh, so, and, it's, and it tends to, you know, it tends to grab people, and I think that, uh, you know, I'm going to use what works as long as I maintain my principles in that, in that path. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. So, anyone on the sub? I actually agree <laughs> with uh, Clint where he said I, I don't have an issue using uh, any rhetoric as long as it's honest and straightforward, and it's not a compromise on your your beliefs. And I think that um, whether you're a minarchist or an anarchist, if you will, or you know any of the other variants, ultimately it comes down to you look at it and you say the state is the problem in some way. So how can it not be effectively them and us, them who are in the state, you know, right, or those who are using it to their advantage, billionaires and whatnot, uh, and then everybody else, which is like all of us in this room. This is a billionaire that I don't know about. <laughs> you know, and so I, I think it's kind of, I think it kind of naturally goes with libertarianism to a degree, like it has to, because otherwise, how can we say the state is the problem? All right, one last question, quick. Um, so I think you can all answer this pretty quickly, actually. So, uh, and I know all four of you are active on Twitter, so hence my question is that which two or three of the state affiliate accounts do you think are the golden examples for the best? Uh, Twitter messaging that's out there. In Tennessee. <laughs> that's a good answer. Tennessee. Man, I, you know, it's hard because I, I don't know all of them. I only know some of the more vocal ones. Uh, I think I prefer Kentucky. I think, I, I think I like Kentucky a lot because they, they kind of ride up a little bit on the edge. Sometimes they, they push the buttons. But there's just a lot of good stuff that comes out. And it's only occasionally or people are like, oh my god, I can't believe they just tweeted that. And that's like once or twice every now and then. I'm like, you know, if that's, if that's the worst that it's going to be once or twice, like, how, how is that easily defendable? Um, yeah, I would, I would probably say Kentucky, I think, has been the best one. And I also will say that I think that uh, while New Hampshire has um, certainly had a few that I wasn't thrilled with, when, when they're good, they are great. Um, so, you know, like, they, they're, they go over the line sometimes, but man, what, when they don't cross it, they're right there, they really zone in. But probably I would put Kentucky as the best one. You, you said you wanted top three, so I'll go. Some, top three? Uh, I thought that's what I said. I don't know. We covered. I said two. <laughs> what the hell? Oh, okay, okay. Well, Kentucky, it doesn't matter. Kentucky, Tennessee, Florida, uh, those are, are my people, my favorite. And then New Hampshire just coming in for like the hate makers here and there. <laughs> but, um, as a fire starter, starter myself, I really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, that, that concludes. We're out of time. Five, five o'clock. Appreciate everyone's up. I'm sure they'd love to connect you.